Hello, my name is David Lee. I am with Prevent Connect, and I am really proud to be working in our partnership with Resonance Network for today's web conference, Reimagining Gender for a World Without Violence, Art and Storytelling Led by Black Organizers. Thank you all for joining us from all around the country. We're going to have a lot of people joining us today for this web conference. It's great to see you all here. My name is David Lee, and I um, use the he, him, his um, pronouns, and I am accompanied with my colleague, um, Tori Vanderlin, who is um, doing a lot of behind-the-scenes work on getting today's web conference going. Hi, Tori. Hi, David. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. If you need any technical assistance, I am logged in under Ashley Klein's account, so feel free to send me a direct message. Great. Thank you so much. And uh, just for Prevent Connect, just so you get a little bit of information, Prevent Connect um, you can reach us at our email address and info at Prevent Connect. You, um, we have an email group if you want to do that. We have e-learnings. You can follow us on Twitter. You can follow us on Facebook. We encourage you to visit our website at preventconnect.org. You all did to be able to sign up to this web conference. We also have Resonance Network, and um, who we are partnering with for this series of web conferences. You'll be hearing shortly about Resonance Network. Visit Resonance Network at their website, resonancenetwork.org. You can also follow them on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and have email information available there. Just want to talk a little bit about how to use Adobe Connect. We have many different functions. One of them is the text chat. You have already been writing in the text chat. It appears on the right-hand side of your screen. People are sharing their names and their organizations and the weather where they are. We've got people from all over. I see another Albany, New York, and Lebanon, New Hampshire, um, and uh, Venice, California, and Cloudy in Pennsylvania. Um, so that's how you can be able to write that. If you want to do a private chat, you can, you can see um, there's an opportunity to be able to write, um, pick people's names and do a private chat. So we want to encourage you. Um, if you want to be able to do that, that you can send private messages. We do have PowerPoint slides for today's presentation. Those will be placed on the Prevent Connect website. Also, Tori is right now going to, I believe, post the link to that in the text chat. So if you want to get a copy of the slides with all of the links that we have today, that you can get all of those slides available. We also have um, some polling questions that we want to ask of, to understand who is in the audience. So I'm going to, we're going to put the first one. Tori, you're going to place that on. Great. So our first question is, have you attended a web conference before today? So let us know if this is the first web conference you've ever gone to. Yes, you've attended um, web conferences, but this is the first time you've, you've um, attended, but the first time you've been on a Prevent Connect web conference. Let us know if you've been on one or two previous Prevent Connect web conferences, or if you've been on three or more Prevent web conferences. So we just want to get a sense of who's in the audience and how many people have participated. So go ahead and keep on voting. I believe we are broadcasting the results live, so you can see the results as we are going. Um, so there are um, almost 13% of you. It's the first time you've ever been on a web conference, and another 29% of you that you have not been on Prevent Connect web conferences before. It's now 15%. And 45% of you have been on um, many, three or more Prevent Connect web conferences. So we have, um, there's great to see some, almost 40% of you are new to us, so welcome. We hope um, we have been doing this series. This is our second in our series with Resonance Network, and we do a wide range of web conferences on advancing prevention and the um, uh, uh, sexual and domestic violence and with Resonance Network on building um, communities without violence. And so we'll be sharing more with that. So I'm going to take that polling question off, and we're going to ask another question to get a chance to know who's in the audience. So what lens? are you bringing to this web conference? So pick all of them that make sense to you. Are you an, do you see yourself as an activist, as movement building, as a self-organizing, as community organizing? 
Do you see yourself doing healing work, a parent caregiver? Are you a free radical? Are you a survivor or survivor supporter? Are you an advocate, a prevention practitioner, a public health practitioner, sexual or domestic violence coalition work? There's a whole range of them, so go ahead and post. I am seeing that some that um, half of our audience, more than half, describe themselves as advocates. Um, Almost half are seeing themselves as prevention practitioners and doing sexual or domestic violence coalition work. Um, I see that over 40% described as activists. A third do healing work. Um, almost 30% do community organizing. I see um, and that 40% are survivors or survivor supporters. Um, and we even have a little more than 10% of public health people. And a few of you are other. If you're other, I'd love to know what that work is that you're doing. We do have about 10% of our parents and caregivers. So thank you so much for being able to share um, as get a sense of who's in the audience. I see a lot of activists and people that are working to make change for themselves, their community, and their community. We. Um, also, on the phone, you can be listening on the computer, or if you're having trouble listening on the computer, some people have bandwidth challenges, you can call in, and you'll just see that there's a, from, it looks like it's from Ashley, though it was actually Tori who did it, put down the phone number that you can call in. We do have closed captioning available. Our partners from Aberdeen Captioning are doing real-time captioning to create that access, and you should see that on the bottom of your screen. Our web conference guidelines are, we want to just encourage you to be, we're in a large group of people. I, there's looks like we're almost at 200 people already at the web conference. There'll be a few more that are going to be coming in. So keep your comments related to the topics. Do comment in the text chat that it, we, it's the way we communicate with each other. So do go ahead and write your comments and your thoughts. If it's a private message, send a private message to the person but we really want to encourage that communication. Um, and great to see some people, including um, some people who I know. I'm seeing several of those names here. Great to see you joining us for this web conference. Prevent Connect focuses on domestic violence and intimate partner violence and sexual violence. We look at violence across the lifespan, including child sexual abuse, all the way to elders. What Prevent Connect focuses on is how to prevent before violence starts. We also are connected about connecting to other forms of violence and oppression. We like to connect to other people who are doing prevention work, and we are really proud to be able to connect with Resonance Network um, in the wonderful work that they are doing. And so this is what, what Prevent Connect is about. And we have, this is our second in our series with web conferences with Resonance Network. We will be doing more. We encourage you to go to our last web conference um, experimenting, learning, and moving to a world without violence. Um, we just put a link to it. it. We have a recording of it available. All of our web conferences are available on our website so you can get recordings of all full range. We've done literally hundreds of web conferences over the last 14 years, and we're really glad to start working with Resonance Network now. So with this, I'm going to get ready to begin today's, um, get to the content of what we're talking about today, of today's web conference, Reimagining Gender for a World Without Violence, Art and Storytelling Led by Black Organizers. And with this, our objectives today is we want to identify the benefits of art and storytelling to prevent violence, describe shared oppression and identity, and identify actions to center violence prevention for trans women, queer women, and women of color in the movement to end gender-based violence, identify ways to practice world building through creative outlets to envision a world without violence, and discuss opportunities for connection sharing and continuing conversations from the brand new publication, Black Freedom Beyond Borders, Reimagining Gender in Wakanda. And so with that, I am really proud to introduce our facilitators today from Resonance Network. We have Alexis Flanagan. Hi, Alexis. Hi, David. I'm so excited to be here today and so excited to be talking about this beautiful anthology. Great. And you're joined by your colleague, um, Kasmira Carter-Howard. Hi, Kasmira. Hi, David. How are you? I am doing great. It's so great. So why don't the two of you introduce our our speakers today? We have a little bit of, so go ahead and 
introduce them. Um, so today we are joined by our wonderful staff um, from Wakanda Dream Lab. We have Rufaro. Hi, Rufaro. Hi, Tasmir. Hi, everyone. Um, and Aisha, unfortunately, was not able to make it, but we are also joined by um, one of our amazing contributors, Tanji Reese. Hi, Tanji. Hi, Casimir. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you all for joining us today. Um, we're really excited to talk about the anthology. I'm going to pass it back to um, Alexis to give us a little intro about what's going on at Residence. Oh, actually, before we do that, we're going to ask a question of our audience. So let's um, to frame how what resonance is. To you, what does a world without violence look like? So I want you to write in the text chat what a world without violence looks like. So go ahead and write in. And so Alexis and Katharina, I, I saw the first comment that came in was freedom. Yes, freedom. And look at all the texture that's coming in about what that looks like. Peaceful, logical, orderly, compassionate society, respect, acceptance, understanding, safe for all humans, animals, and plants. Trusting, sharing, everyone can feel safe, relaxed, respects human dignity, wow, breathing easily, radical self-love, a safe environment for all, radical empathy, space for thriving, absolutely. Oh, it's great. So we see these. This is um, exciting. It's great. So, Alexis, these really align with what um, Resonance Network is about. So why don't um, I'm going to move to the slide, and why don't you describe what Resonance Network is? Yeah, thank you so much, um, David. What really excites me about this question is the amount of literal resonance that we are noticing exists in the movement and exists in the world when people have a chance to breathe for just one second, even if it's in the little beat where we have to answer this question, uh, to think about what a world looks like without violence. And so Resonance Network is a community of people who are uh, engage together around a particular purpose, and that purpose is to, um, to, to imagine, to create, to hold space, to make space, to take space, for us to imagine and practice what is possible and what is necessary if we are going to, um, to if we're going to survive, actually, and if we're going to more than survive. Um, if we're going to transform what has become a very normalized culture of violence into one of interdependence, worthiness, and thriving, where the realities that folks are calling forward in this text chat become our realities because we are insistent and defiant against what would prevent us from experiencing that right now, and also because we have taken time to boldly and unapologetically imagine what those futures can look for, can look like, and to strategize and build towards those futures. So as a network, if um, people see themselves within that purpose to reimagine and practice what's possible, what's necessary to transform a culture of violence into one of independence, worthiness, and thriving. We like to say that you're resonant, too, and um, we're just happy to have this opportunity to be in a series to talk about our work, to talk about how we're building community in uh, the United States and how we're building uh, a movement to orient towards boldly organizing for what we're for. So thank you for this opportunity to be here today. So why don't we just um, can uh, describe Wakanda, what um, the sort of the project of Wakanda Dream Lab just very briefly, and then we're going to go to the audience to ask a question about Wakanda, our life, how well we imagine for Wakanda. So, um, Alexis or Kasmira, do you want to just talk briefly of what, um, how 
where residents did to support Wakanda Dream Lab? Hey, David. I think uh, Casimir is going to call out and call back in. There's a challenge with audio. And so, so we're excited to talk about our partnership today with, um, with Wakanda Dream Lab. We are in community with this beautiful collective of folks who are imagining how we manifest the possibilities and shape the possibilities of Wakanda um, right here today. And so for Wakanda, for those, okay, great. Are you on, Katsumira? Yep, I'm here. Technology is great when it works. <laughs> it is. Um, so we partnered with Wakanda Dream Lab to um, practice some of our values, um, one of which is storytelling and thinking about what it's like to imagine a future without um, gender-based violence. And what I really love about this partnership is that it, we, we talk about um, this ending violence against women and girls, ending violence against gender oppressed people, um, and that is what we're all striving for, but we also need to think about what it takes to imagine this world that we want to live in. And if we can't imagine it, how can we build that? And so this was a great exercise in practicing that imagination and exercising that muscle so that we can create this new world that we want to live in and um, not recreate the same structures that are currently oppressing us. Um, and so we, um, we sent out the call to um, folks in our networks and also in other folks' networks, and we really wanted to get uh, a wider range of um, of stories and ideas and opinions from people who might not necessarily call themselves activists or might not necessarily call themselves movement makers. Um, so it was a really great mesh between like our circles of gender-based violence and the world of domestic and sexual violence, but also um, the world of fan fiction, the world of Black Panther, the world of Wakanda. Um, and it allowed, it became a great accessibility point for folks who might not necessarily be in this conversation that we are often having with each other, um, but being able to bring in new folks as well to join this conversation and doing it with something as accessible as Black Panther. So many people saw that movie, so many people saw this world um, that you have the space to recreate and reimagine what you want that world to look like. And so putting this, um, putting a social justice lens on that and talking about gender liberation in this context um, gave us a lot of great ideas and a lot of great stories. Um, so we're really excited to share the anthology with you all um, because it has so many, so many great stories, so many great um, a visual art about what this world could look like and um, and a world that is free from violence and for all folks um, of any gender expression being able to live fully and wholly in, in themselves in a space that is as black and as wonderful as Wakanda. For those who are not familiar with Black Panther, can you just give the, the one sentence summary of what Wakanda is? Yes, um, Wakanda is um, like a black utopia that is um, centered in um, the continent of Africa. And at the beginning, they were closed off in an isolation um, from the rest of the world. And you'll see in the movie that there's a decision to open up their borders um, to uh, the larger world and to be in conversation with the rest of the world as we know it. And um, that's part of the, the title that we're working with. Black Freedom Beyond Borders, thinking about what it's like to live beyond this, bi this binary of borders, this binary of genders, this binary of immigration, and being able to put all of those things in conversation with each other. Great. So let's go to our audience and just would like to get some thoughts for you all. How does gender and gender liberation sound, smell, look, feel, and taste like in Wakanda? So we want to invoke Wakanda in everyone in the audience. And how does gender and gender liberation sound, smell, look, feel, taste like in Wakanda? And so let's go ahead and write this in the text chat. I know several people are walking. And um, just thinking about what is gender and gender li liberation sound, smell, look, feel, and taste like in Wakanda. So Casamira and um, 
and Alexis, I know people are typing now. I see acceptance yeah. and rejuvenating already coming in. Um, so this is one of the prompts that we sent out to folks when um, accepting submissions and getting them to think about it and trying to be as concrete as possible. So it's exciting to be able to share this prompt with you all so that you all can get into this practice as well of, of imagining um, gender liberation. So I see people are already starting to write in. It smells like honey and few shea butter, fresh, green, and crisp, um, like the first warm, fresh breeze of spring. Um, it looks like women as warriors. It, looks, it smells like or tastes like honey and waterfalls. Um, strength and divinity or dignity, freedom. Um, all gender expressions are va valued and honored. Um, relaxation, strong, fearless. Um, strength without suffering. It feels like a new normal. It feels like a warm hug or a supportive smile from a non for for those non huggers. Um, energizing, connected, trans bodies being celebrated and centered. These are all really great. Yes, to all of the futurists who are contributing to the chat. Great. Well, thank you so much. So why don't we move to um, Rafaro is going to actually take the section that I each show is going to talk about. So Rafaro, we're going to hand the podium over to you and talk about why this anthology and how we got here. Thanks very much. Um, again, Mangwanani, good morning. Maskati, good afternoon. Um, why the anthology and how we got here? So um, Wakanda Dream Lab, the core team is comprised of uh, Calvin Williams, Terry Marshall, Aisha Schillingford, and myself. Calvin and Terry are friends and have been friends for a long time who also happen to connect around the Marvel Universe, Wakanda, all those things, all those things. And so um, as uh, the release of the Black Panther movie um, was moving forward and there was lots of excitement and um, folks were figuring out, well, how, what do we do with this? How do we harness um, the energy of this, particularly as people of the black diaspora, of the African diaspora? Um, we got into a conversation, Calvin, Terry, Aisha, and myself, and we knew each other um, through Movement Strategy Center's um, Transitions Community. And so we started talking about what the Black Panther represented, as well as what Wakanda represented as a country that was still very much steeped in its indigeneity and also had not been colonized. And so we were thinking about what a transition to that kind of way of being for Black people, for people of African descent could be. So um, we were talking about how we could, as, as, as activists, actually bring some of our values, bring what it is that we care about as organizers out into the world with folks who might not be organizers, who might not think in those terms, but who are committed to and believe in the liberation of people of African descent, knowing that when we are liberated, then everyone else, too, would be liberated. And so, um, next slide, please. And so we wanted to ensure that we could put out a resource into the world ahead of the launch of the movie. Um, we drew from the lore of the, of the Wakanda universe and Marvel universe, but then also infused some of our own questions around um, how we ensure that resources are equitably distributed in Wakanda. Calvin and I live in Oakland, and Aisha and Terry are in, in, in New York. And within our respective communities, gentrification has been a big thing that's forced a lot of um, black folks, but also um, people of color, out of the communities. So that was a question we were grappling with. Um, we looked at what the relationship we want between our labor and income 
uh, and access to the resources we need for our well-being to be. Again, um, we were thinking in terms of how we can be expansive in thinking about and actually practicing into um, something that is beyond extraction that sometimes comes with our nine to five jobs. Um, and so as we were thinking about the viewing guide as well, in addition to the initial um, questions that I raised around resource distribution, we were also thinking um, in terms of what gender equity, what gender liberation looks like in Wakanda. Little did we know that that would actually become what we base our next anthology on. So um, migration um, and the crisis at the southern border, southern U.S. border, as well as in Europe and beyond, <laughs> has been front and center um, for a while now. And at the time that we started thinking about our first anthology, um, in many ways the stories of people of African descent as migrants were going untold in the 24 news cycle, 24 hour news cycle. Um, and as people among the four of us who have um, the, the experience, whose families have the experience of migration, um, we knew that it was important for the stories of black migrants to be told and to be told from a place of being visionary in what it could look like if we could migrate to a place where we were wanted, migrate to a place where we could thrive and be our best selves. And so drawing from the Black Panther movie, um, we posed this question, what if Wakanda opened its borders to the African diaspora? Um, we had a variety of prompts. And um, for this anthology, we actually just reached out to folks in our immediate circles um, we are a teeny tiny team without a lot of resources. And so we were determined to put an anthology out into the world, but also knew that we needed to be smart in um, how we did our outreach in order to be able to produce something fairly quickly. And so um, this anthology was quite illuminating in some of the pieces that came out. One piece that really stayed with me and continues to stay with me actually is around um, reconciliation. Why had Wakanda isolated itself for so long while Africans were enslaved, while Africans were stolen from the continent and taken all over the world against their will? And so from a place of practicing into the world that we want to see, practicing into a place that is free of violence. This question of reconciliation for me in that, in that, in that piece by Saida Agostini was actually around accountability um, and what it takes for community to be held to account when violence is visited upon our own and we turn a blind eye. Um, <clears throat> So as we got a lot of buzz following the publication of our first anthology, um, we started having a conversation about what the next anthology would be about. Um, gender as a theme had shown up in the migration anthology, um, and also, frankly, the world around us was showing us that if we did not actually lift up gender liberation, and questions of gender injustice in our next anthology, then we were being blind to very, very real issues, particularly as they relate to um, the murders and violence against um, trans women of color, and particularly black women, black trans women, as well as um, the murders of um, indigenous women, many of whom are missing and have been unaccounted for. And so, oh, and then, of course, um, we were having this conversation in the midst of the travesty <laughs> that was the, the um, Supreme Court he hearing for the person who is now one of the justices. 
And so in an act for us, in an act of solidarity for the most impacted communities, um, we decided to come up with the second anthology, which would really center those who are most impacted and allow for us to continue to vision into what gender liberation, what gender freedom looks like. And so, again, um, following this theme of feeling, because oftentimes when we're living in a world where violence is the norm, we forget how to feel. Or perhaps it's more that we don't want to feel because it's too hard, because we might be paralyzed for it. And so one of the que some of the questions that we posed, how does gender and gender liberation feel in Wakanda? What societal structures ensure everyone experiences gender freedom? Why and how are women, trans folks, and gender non-conforming people safe in Wakanda? How are women and TN TGNC folks part of Wakanda's evolution? These questions are important because we believe that in order to get to the world that we say we're building into, we must actually practice into feeling, practice into imagining, well, what would that world look like? And our hope is that from some of the stories that came through, folks can actually experiment in their communities, pull a story, pull, in, pull, pull a poem, pull even some of the imagery in the anthology, and play with it in place in small groups in your communities. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Can you refer to so let's let's go to the audience. And we'd like to get a sense and um, this is using Black Panther as inspiration and to be able to pose these important and necessary questions about gender and reimagining gender. So we want to get from the audience what are the stories, what is the pop culture or other culture events that inspire you to envision and practice world building for a world without violence? Um, Faro shared an example that was around the Black Panther, but we've gone, we know that there are other types of inspiration. So um, let's go ahead and what stories, pop culture, other cultural events inspire you to envision and practice world building for a world without violence? And, Alexis and Casimira, I see people are already jumping in. Steve, I see Steven Universe and Pose on Netflix, Paris is Burning, Derek Bell's Space, uh, Space Traders, Alfred Everything Lizzo, <laughs> Solar Punk Community in speculative and science fiction space, all of the like so rich um, con all the contributions of Afrofuturist literature that exists out there. I'm going to ask an uh, extra special plug for folks to drop in your favorite Afrofuturist uh, contributions into the chat. All of Octavia Butler, Queer Eye, uh, let's see, definitely we've got lots of people supporting um, Steven Universe, what's happening with, you t with me too. Nnedi Okafor, N.K. Jensen. Um, I'm also seeing Saul Williams, Jojo Abbott, um, Tommy Adeyami, uh, Janelle Monet, all these young activists in their collective hours. Shout out to the young people. Um, Missy Elliott, Blackish. I'm loving all of these. Um, one day at a time, the climate change movement, mothership tales from Afrofuturism and beyond, Tikna Khan, the Red Table, Red Table Fox. Yes, um, these are all really great examples. Lemonade by Beyonce will always be a classic. The Read podcast. John Legend's music video, Dear White People. Um, Aquafina for Asian Community Advocacy, The Water Catcher. 
what a fabulous list. Mm -hmm. We're going to compile this and at the end, um, and we'll have um, we'll you know, take a little bit of time, but we'll put this onto the Prevent Connect um, website with this web conference recording, so everyone can have a list of the our crowdsourcing all the great um, places that people are looking for. Absolutely, we've got a whole syllabus form in here. Dear white people from Barb, who's with sitting with students right now, Adrienne Marie Brown, absolutely. Um, yeah, the Black Lady Sketch Show is on HBO right now. We are um, um, seeing that folks who are on this call are, are uh, just seeing what is very, very present right now, is that people are addressing and imagining um, uh, gender liberation in real ways and things that we come in contact with, maybe even in times that we're not paying attention or, or not necessarily wearing um, our social justice glasses. So this is exciting to see. So, Rafara, why don't you um, talk about the next section? I uh, you know you was one right after the other, but um, what I, you've got some. Um, so let's go back to you, Rafara. Thank you. Okay, Rafara, maybe so, you can talk I'll, a little bit about our process mm -hmm. and what we learned as a team. And I'm here. Tab me in if you need me. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I'll start by saying that none of what I'm going to share is new to folks on this call. At least it shouldn't be. Rather, I'm sharing based on um, experience, on our experience bringing the anthology alive. Um, so when the Wakanda Dream Lab team started talking about the anthology around this time last year, we knew that it wasn't enough for us to do it on our own. In the political climate, um, we knew that in order to have wider reach and impact, we would need a bigger team, a bigger we. So we thought about folks that we already knew who are committed to transformation, who are committed to vision-led storytelling, and whose values align with our own beliefs around black liberation as a prerequisite for liberation of all people. The Resonance Network team immediately came to mind, um, and this was fairly easy because we moved in shared circles through Movement Strategy Center's Transitions Community. Um, we were also part of the Transformative Movement Leadership Training and the wider Move to End Violence Community. In our initial meetings, we focused on building a shared vision for the anthology while also being transparent about our organizational goals and aspirations for what could happen with the anthology. Um, in preparing for today, I went back to see our first email exchanges about the anthology. My email took me all the way back to last November as the Resonance Network team and Wakanda Dream Lab team tried to schedule conversations in the midst of end of year happenings. Once the Wakanda Dream Lab team had drafted and shared an agreement with Resonance, this was the response from Alexis. Sorry, Alexis, you didn't know this was going to happen. <laughs> what a beautiful MOU. It's refreshing to be discussing this valued, aligned agreement. Through the agreement, we embraced the following principles of collaboration, which we borrowed and remixed from collaborative work we've done with other folks. The first thing, vision and strength space. We strive to embody the humanity and future we wish to see. We challenge ourselves to constantly lead with yes and envision what an alternative future looks like. We treat each other with the yes as well, building roles that fit our strengths and capacity, accountability that is grounded in respect and good of the group, and we lift up each other's gifts. The second principle, mutual interest and exchange. We engage in collaboration to meet shared vision and goals that include organizational interests. We're transparent, holding a spirit of generosity in our offering of time and talent. We hold each other up in the process. The third principle, experimentation. We join hands in exploring the unknown together, 
We push for creative solutions, brainstorm, and test. We learn together rather than point fingers. We rejoice in both mistakes and successes. So, integral to making the anthology happen was relationship, relationship, relationship. Our organizations were in relationship with each other and on the same page about where we wanted to go. The real magic, though, came from knowing that the people who would be working together are committed to our own transformation so that we can get to a place where our individual transformation supports community transformation, which in turn supports transformation of society at large. Coming to the table together, we knew that we brought organizational strengths and specific resources. Wakanda Dream Lab had the experience of publishing our first anthology and doing so with limited resources. Resonance Network had the experience of gathering large virtual storytelling and world-building communities, as well as financial resources and hiring capacity. So as a starting point, that's how we divvied up the tasks for what it would take to bring the anthology to life. As we built out the team, bringing on the editors, communications managers, and graphic design and artistic director, we set about getting to know each other as best we could virtually. We grounded in the shared vision of the anthology and actively bringing our whole selves to our meetings and ultimately the work. Some of our check-in questions went like this. Who would you most want to meet on the ancestral plane? What would you ask them? What do you think they would say to you? What can we count on you for during the apocalypse? How do you lie? We had the task of cohering the team quite quickly and doing so from a place of recognizing and fostering interdependence. Uh, with apologies for any mispronunciation, help me and let me help you. No one person could do all the things that needed to happen from initial concept development, to hiring consultants, to editing, ensuring popping social media, to fact checking Wakanda and Marvel Universe lore, to laying out the anthology, to processing payments, and ensuring the work kept moving or pivoted as needed. Even with our plan, ambitious timeline, and highly talented team, the fact of the matter is a small core resonance network and Wakanda Dream Lab team plus SAMA equals a breakneck relay race. The baton passed hands multiple times so that the work could keep moving as folks dipped in and out to handle other work obligations, twists and turns in life, and of course, vacations. And we had to shape shift, moving up to take up tasks that weren't necessarily the main thing we were supposed to be holding in our original divvying up of tasks and roles. The transitions were mostly seamless because we communicated often. Email, Zoom, Slack, text, WhatsApp, and the phone were our friends. And most important was our trust in each other. The main driver of our successful work together as a team hinged on establishing and leaning into trust, deep collaboration and shared leadership, common vision for the anthology and commitment to gender liberation, regular communication, and specifically via media that made sense in the moment and for each person, and above all else, having each other's backs. E-learnings. I, I'd like to take us back to the principles of collaboration as I delve into the key learnings. Be open and flexible as reflections of the principles of mutual interest and exchange, as well as experimentation. An example of this learning happened fairly early. Our original plan for how we would recruit editors and contributors had to change as we realized our deadlines did not, in fact, allow folks time and space to respond. We overcame that obstacle by together going back to the drawing board and reworking our timeline. Be real and ready to name and interrupt habits. We practiced all three principles of collaboration 
of being vision and strength based, having mutual interest and exchange and experimentation. An example of this is that as our timeline felt tighter and tighter, and we tried to push it out incrementally, we called a timeout. We compared schedules, shared what, what each of the core team members could realistically do, and recalibrated accordingly. We did this holding that in order to produce something beautiful and impactful, we intentionally had to interrupt the habits around working with time scarcity by practicing into the abundance that comes with slowing down and creating more spaciousness. Practice into the transformation by being vision and strength-based and holding mutual interest and exchange as principles. One of my favorite practices as we approached the finish line and prepared to launch the anthology was around naming for ourselves and encouraging each other to let go of perfectionism. This all happened in the flurry of text messages, sometimes late into the night. Transformation requires us to turn ourselves inside out, shedding that which no longer serves us, giving fully of ourselves while not depleting ourselves or others, and knowing when we've done enough and we're complete. Celebrate each other. Celebrate each other. On celebration, big appreciation and gratitude to the whole team. Alexis Flanagan, Amir Kadar, Aisha Schillingford, Asha Grant, Calvin Williams, Delina Adabo, Dolores Sapoy, Emmanuel Brown, Casimir Carter Howard, Sean A. Watkins, Terry Marshall, and Jasmine Yoni. And of course, we celebrate the writers and visual artists who trusted us including sometimes in a multi-round editing process. They allowed us to share their gifts with the world. Without their offerings, there would be no anthology. Majita, thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, for our really, um, those lessons learned. And let's reflect back to the audience. Um, so one of the lessons was really about what deep collaboration was and how you really, Rafaro shared the example of how building this anthology was a deep collaboration. So I'm going to ask the audience, if all are committed to transforming our world to one without violence, what will it take to achieve deep collaboration with each other? So go ahead and in the text chat, if we're all committed to transforming our world to one without violence, what will it take to achieve deep collaboration with each other? So we want to get a chance um, for, to reflect to the audience. And Katsumira and Alexis, um, our audience is jumping right in. Honesty, trust. I see check our egos, deep listening, genuine engagement being willing to have difficult conversations and leaning into that discomfort, having cultural humility, love and empathy and hard work, respect and honesty, trust, access, acceptance of the truth, humility, patience, empathy, vulnerability, deep trust that starts with honoring deep um, trust in the courageous spacious spaces to hold, respect and engage with those truths, being open and being ready to be wrong, community accountability, accountability to harm, challenging capitalism, disrupting the habits of white supremacy in our organizations, having get difficult conversations with our children, um, sharing power, honesty, compassion, open to unlearning and relearning, community care, honoring our forefathers, love and patience, lifting up the importance of relationship building, listening and loving without judgment, grace and forgiveness towards one another, which is huge, especially as we struggle to create this new world together um, and not knowing what is coming ahead. Um, courage, nurturing. So 
when you read that customary, what comes to mind? I mean, what a powerful <laughs> list. Yeah, I was taking that in. Um, these are all really important aspects and things that came up as I was reading the stories and editing them. And um, you can see all of these themes in the stories and the poems um, that folks wrote. And I think that accountability, that community care, that learning and unlearning, all of those being willing and being open to doing that and like caring for each other as we struggle through it together, I think it's going to be really important because um, we're all, you know, dealing with different forms of oppression and um, hurt people often hurt people. And so how do we, you know, love on each other even more to work through these differences and figure out um, how to create a world where we are all um, free from this violence, knowing that we don't have, ne we don't have, uh, specific examples of what that freedom might look like, but again, like this anthology and these exercises of practicing what that looked like are really important, and it'll allow us to work out those kinks now so that once we do dismantle these systems, dismantle the patriarchy and the sexism and the racism, that we can rebuild with much stronger foundation. Yeah, Samira, I love that. and. You know, I don't necessarily see this language in the chat, but it seems like what the listeners who are on with us know so much about is that collaboration and transformation um, together, like, requires, like, deeply being in and respecting our own humanity and, like, taking responsibility for um, having been shaped by this culture of violence and that all of us have work to do to unlearn those things and to learn how to be, to, to be different. And that's not just going to happen in one, uh, like, you know, just one time. Like, I see practice and, you know, it's, it, you know, ongoing uh, <clears throat> commitment reflected in what participants are sharing in the chat. And all of that is what we learned in this process together of, of recommitting again and again to, to these values and to these practices of um, being still and like being able to take a breath and a beat long enough to see where our habits were showing up and getting in the way and, uh, and grounding in something that, um, that we know uh, like helps us to, to, to flourish and thrive when, uh, you know, to, to, to interrupt those habits and to do something different and to go in a different direction. So we, we're just, we're grateful to be in conversation with so many people who, um, um, who resonate with, with what that looks like to, to like be in a committed work of transforming together as we're producing something that we're offering to the world, uh, to invite uh, more folks into that uh, conversation and into that practice. And what I love about you know, these responses is that there is a collective willingness to want to do this work, or that, like a yearning to want to do this work. Um, we all realize how this violence is impacting us in our communities, and we're all longing for something different. And it like awareness of the problem is the first step, right? And so being able to then name the steps that we do need to take is the next step and being able to then practice those and put those um, into our daily practices um, so that those become our new habits um, is going to be really important. And, and I'm seeing that it's being practiced in the text chat right now amongst our audience. Um, we. Um, let's move to our next, um, to Tanji Reese. Um, so um, I believe, Kesmer, you want to start her off? Yeah. Um, so we're so excited to have Tanji on um, the webinar today. Tanji was one of the contributors to the story, or she contributed the story to the anthology, and um, she was able to engage in this process with us. Um, from that perspective, and so I'm really excited to hear like everything you learned about um, this process and what it was like for you, um, kind of coming into this as somebody who is willing and ready to practice um, reimagining this world without violence. Hi, Tanji. Hi, thank you. Uh, I am excited to be here, and I'm I'm grateful that you all have me here. When I first saw the 
call for submissions, I was really excited because it combines um, things that I really enjoy, uh, most specifically uh, how I love Black Panther, I love Afrofuturism, so I was really happy to see all uh, the, the writers in the text box that folks brought up. Um, but I also just am a fan of all things Black at any time. Um, I can involve myself in something like that. I'm with it. But uh, I was really interested because it had a lens of gender-based violence prevention in it, uh, which is what I'm passionate about. So um, that intersection of art and activism was what drew me in. Uh, it, and honestly, it's really a part of the movement, has always been a part of the movement in sexual violence, is incorporating literature and writing with um, activism. So we see that with folks like Alice Walker, Sonia Sanchez, Maya Angelou, Nikki Giovanni. And we see it even now with folks like N.K. Jemison, um, who are writing about Afrofuturism, but doing it from a social justice lens. Um, I don't know where I saw this, this or heard it, but uh, it's a quote that came from somewhere um, that social justice is science fiction. Uh, in order to think about the world in a different way, we have to think beyond what is real um, and what is what the reality is. And so um, I was immediately drawn in when I saw it. And then afterwards, seeing the writing prompts, um, I was more inspired uh, because it challenged me, really. It made me think outside of even what I believed and what I know. Um, and sometimes thinking like, well, really for me, thinking about um, a space where there is liberation and freedom from violence um, among black folks is, is like risky thinking. Because, uh, And I feel like sometimes even with like people who believe in prevention, sometimes that belief has a limit. And this, the writing prompts in this project uh, didn't really have any limits. It was like stretching beyond what even I thought was possible within um, a lifetime. So uh, it was really a, an empowering process just to think more about the writing prompts um, and think about what Wakanda would look like for me uh, and really what a world would look like where black people are at the center and present and alive um, and free. And so uh, it was a process, and I'm happy that I decided to, to submit. I'm not a writer in that, a fiction writer in, in that sense. I do it as a hobby. Um, so I was a little hesitant to submit because I, I was worried that it would um, not meet up or measure up to folks that are, are writers in that traditional way and do that uh, for a living. So I was really happy and excited when it was accepted. Um, but through that process, it also made me rethink, uh, like, imagination um, and really think about why, as preventionists or even as advocates, we have to have big imagination. Uh, it's, it's necessary. Really, anyone who believes that we can have a more equitable world is using their imagination. And what that does is it instills hope. So uh, we don't always get that every day when we're working. We don't always get opportunities and time or space to imagine. Uh, we can talk about a world without violence all day, but really taking the time out to think about, again, what it feels like, what it smells like, what it sounds like, uh, for me was just a really cathartic kind of process because it's, it's something that doesn't happen often, but I think it, it definitely did make me rethink how I think about prevention in general. Um, so I'm really grateful for Residence Network and Wakanda Dream Lab for this opportunity and really for the opportunity again to join this webinar and to be able to talk about the story that I wrote for it. So when I was thinking about writing, again, I'm not a writer in that traditional sense, uh, and I've never submitted anything that was fiction writing before, um, but I felt like it was too great of an opportunity to not get involved with. And I went back and I read, I watched Black Panther again. It was, it wasn't like the first, like the second time or anything like that. It was probably more like the 20th time. But I went back and read it again, but did it more so to make sure that I was able to capture what Wakanda kind of looked like. And I remember when I first saw the movie, I thought really a lot about the dorm lives. I thought about who they were, but also um, thought it was cool that it was, there were women warriors. Um, and they were there to protect the king, which is really different from, 
I mean, think about even like American roots of like our armies in America. That's not what we always see, not for a long time anyway. So I was really interested in that. And that made me think about their backstories. Uh, oftentimes we associate women with being like wives and mothers. Um, and that's why I was inspired to write about them because um, we don't always make that connection between uh, like being a warrior, but also being a, like maybe a wife or a mother or or not, right? Or even <laughs> thinking about like just gender outside of like that that binary and thinking about uh, thinking about it differently from the way that women are often socialized. And what I decided to do with the story was try to move into a more multi-dimensional lens, which is also necessarily too with Black women, um, because Black women are oftentimes socialized differently uh, than other folks. And the way that we view gender a lot of time is really white centric. So for me, it was a dual process of like rethinking uh, black women, but also um, again, women in general. So I also thought um, in a story, focus um, on how we view strength and masculinity, uh, which if we think about how, again, black women are socialized or even black girls are viewed as being more masculine. So, um, in a lot of studies and a lot of articles, it's looked at as something that is kind of like a bad thing, but I decided to take it back and honor that and looking at strength as something um, that is good and something that is honored and valued. So um, here is just a little couple sentences uh, on the screen for those who are on the phone about uh, well, a little excerpt from the story. So it says, when the colonizers came during the Great War, we did not know that they would try to rip our people apart. As we know, the Toya Sabwana, known for their strength, were the elite warriors for King Missouri. They were courageous fighters, and to the colonizers forced their so-called masculine ways upon us. So in this story, I created an army that um, I thought would be like the opposite of what the Dermalized stood for, what they were. Um, and that was a part of my inspiration. Another part was just exploring the dynamics of sexual violence in America and how it's rooted in racism. Um, but even, and also thinking about the dynamic of domestic violence within the black community and uh, how colonialism and slavery were a strong influence on those dynamics. So I tried to incorporate all those things into the story in a way that felt like a story, um, but also wanted to create something that offered um, room for interpretation and for discussion. So part of my, uh, the mission for 1124, um, which is a project that I started last year, is uh, which really is reimagining what prevention can look like and how we can move away from traditional ways of education and incorporate things like identity affirmation and media literacy. So again, that's why this project was so, so super aligned with, um, with, with the kind of work that, that I do and what I, what, I, what I believe is necessary for the future of prevention. So most of the time, too, we see creativity and advocacy programming. Uh, it's not often that we see our art and creativity as a center of, of prevention work. And so I believe that it, that is, again, a part of that media literacy and why it's necessary. It's a way for us to see the impact of sexual violence um, or get like a visual interpretation of what trauma looks like. So that's how it's done um, in advocacy work a lot of time or traditional programming when we work with survivors. But prevention, um, again, we don't always see that. So I believe that this tool is really great for that because it is coming from folks who are activists and creative who um, have that balance of imagination, but also um, of what is real and a knowledge of what is real and what needs to be changed in the world. So I really do love the intersection of prevention and creativity um, and imagination all together. And I do believe it's something that can be used uh, for prevention and to, to teach about healthy relationships or about gender-based violence. Um, and projects like this really can help us move closer to prevention program that is rooted in liberation. A lot of times with prevention programming, we focus on um, the, the negative aspects of sexual violence. Uh, we focus on the not and what we shouldn't do as opposed to imagining things in a different way. Um, and that is really what liberation is about. It's about that freedom to explore, that, that freedom to think 
um, outside of what is what we see every single day. Uh, so again, I think that this can be used to create dialogue as well. Um, I really do enjoy how it incorporates visual art and creative writing because those are two things that are up for interpretation. People can um, kind of pull what they want from it and people can get different things from it. The way we comprehend things is different. And I do believe that um, being able to talk about the way we comprehend things differently is an important part of education and, and learning. And I also wanted to create something that was uh, that can be discussed in diverse audiences um, and something that could be digested by young people. So I intentionally wrote something that could be used in like a middle school. It's at a middle school reading level, like between fifth and eighth grade. And I did that on purpose because I wanted it to be something that can be used um, in, in prevention education programs and working with young people. Um, and lastly, when I think about reimagining prevention, I also think about honoring stories. Um, there are never enough black voices. And there are never, uh, there are so many stories that still need to be told. Um, and especially within that intersection of black activism and sexual violence uh, activism and work, there are not enough voices there. So I, I do believe that, um, I hope that this is an opportunity for more, more folks to tap into that creativity and that imagination and incorporate those things in the work that we're doing. So storytelling has always been a part of African and Pan-African learning, so it makes sense uh, that this tool can be used to provide prevention education because, um, again, it's a part of learning. And I, again, I hope this project inspires others to make those connections between storytelling prevention. And I do believe that this is a special piece of work, and I would use it and endorse it even if I was not not involved with it. So thank you again to everyone involved. I appreciate your work. Um, I honor you for doing this and for providing space for this. Thank you, thank you. Tandy. We're so excited to Tandy, have you contribute. Just, yes, that was really inspiring. And we want to go to the audience now to hear. Tanji really gave some, I love you talked about reimagining prevention. And I noticed that half of our audience describe themselves as prevention practitioners and 60% as advocates. So how can you use this anthology and integrate it in your work to create a world without violence? And so I've already seen people starting to talk about, I already see about a white paper getting written and I'm seeing moving forward. So I want to get a sense about how you think you can be able to use this. So let's go. And I see great love going among the LEAP fellows. So that's great to see um, that moving forward. But we want to hear from all of you about how can you use this anthology and integrate it in your work to create violence. And perhaps how can you use this process of this anthology to also integrate it into the work. So we'd love to hear both of those. And go ahead and write in. I see people are on multiple attendees are typing, my computer says. So, um, Tessamira and, um, and Alexis, I see people are starting to come in um, on talking about how they would be able to do this. Uh, yes, people are excited to create spaces for open and rich conversation, and we encourage that. We encourage bringing your people together and um, like reading a story and lifting up uh, um, what resonates in that and, and, and what other possibilities become possible from uh, the, the themes that are addressed. Uh, soaking in and sharing the good from the anthology. Yes, just be with it, right? Just be with all of the magic and goodness that has been offered. Um, sharing the anthology could support so much inspiration and energy for sharing stories. Yes for sharing stories that are fiction, sharing stories that are not fiction, for helping other folks to dream big, uh, absolutely. Folks are still typing. Um, you know, and we're, we're hoping, and we'll talk more about that before we end, about um, catalyzing and supporting some of these conversations to happen. Uh, create a safe space where uh, people just just for having people together. Um, yeah, incorporating this into group work.
Yep, lots of interesting ideas. <laughs> lots of interesting ideas about what can be used. Uh, taking time to imagine together, right? Um, how are our, how can our lives be different? How can our work be different if we just like pause and imagine together? And just throwing like what's real and practical out the window, right? If we if we stay constrained constrained by what we think is 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 uh, uh, possible given our particular vantage point right now, we might miss the opportunity. And that's so much about what we're learning about um, resonance as we cultivate a story, a future, um, a, a cultivate a practice, a future story telling together is that, um, you know, if we try, if we always try to create solutions from taking one step in front of us, we are limited by where we are right now. But if we're willing to just take a risk and be a little bit fantastic, a little bit fanciful, right, and, and jump out and imagine something in the future, if we come back to that one step in front of us, the possibilities that open up are, are um, much more expansive. Um, not always having agenda. Yeah, just being present. Uh, just just being with each other and, and telling stories in a way that is um, uh, connecting to uh, what, what Tanji was saying. Like, these are ancestral practices. If we go back far enough in all of our lineages, um, we were, we're all connected to cultures that use storytelling as a way to transmit knowledge and to transmit culture. And um, there's some benefit that, that, that we're seeing and that we're practicing to, um, to, to making that a part of um, our modern day practice. Redefining warriorship for women in the military. Yeah, yeah. Um, so thank you for all your contributions on and thoughts about how, how to integrate this anthology and to use it um, in your work and in your community. So now we have an opportunity. We have our guests here. We'd love to hear quest get questions from the audience. This is a chance to be able to talk to um, Alfaro and Tanji, and we also have Alexis and Casamira here. So are there any questions or thoughts um, about um, that you have? So we go ahead and in the text chat, go ahead. And this is the opportunity to be able to ask those questions. Um, Tanji, I want to start with you. I'll, I'll start with a question for you. Um, you talk about um, in this, as you're doing, as you've been reimagining prevention, um, has, how have you seen this been able to take root in the community that you've worked with um, since you, um, I know it just got, pub just got published this week, so you haven't had the, the piece, but this process, how has it really strengthened the work that you've been able to do in your community prevention work? Yes, yeah, so I um, was able to share it with, with networks of people. So what I've, I've been doing prevention work uh, since 2011, and I would be lying if I said everybody that I'm connected with was interested in the work that I do. <laughs> um, people sometimes want to separate themselves from anything related to sexual violence or prevention work, where it's not always really interested in the people. So I've been able to share it with with friends and with folks that I know who are into Marvel or into Black Panther and really tell them like, hey, like this is something that you like you should read. Like it don't you like literature? Don't you like artwork? Like this is a cool thing. Um and so that's one way that I've been doing it is just stretching it out. So I have a friend who um has like a blog and does work around like coding and blurs and black women who are you know nerds and I was able to send it to her and she shared it with her network and these are folks who may not have ever thought about gender and what gender looks like uh, within uh, science fiction but also it's the way I feel like to bring the people who do think about that who are already in like the, the gamer and um, science fiction world and bring them into our world into um, the sexual violence movement in a, a unique way. Okay. So I saw there was a question from Lizzie about, I work with students of color. Would you recommend picking a um, text like Black Panther and, um, and going through these principles with them? So whoever wants to, I'm going to open this up to anyone. I can take this one. 
Um, I think that is a great idea for a few reasons. The first being like culturally relevant uh, examples, especially for young people, uh, resonates with them so much better than an example out of a textbook, right? Like they're more inclined to connect with it because that's in pop culture. That's also something that they connect with um, from like racial and ethnic backgrounds. So being able to use something like Black Panther, Black Panther or other examples that they can see themselves represented in, um, and that is interesting to them, one, keeps their attention longer, but two, allows them to um, like reimagine the future using examples uh, of with people and characters that do look like them. Um, and I think especially working with youth, being able to keep up with um, pop cultural um, references allows them to connect with that same material and you can still um, teach them the same lessons or the same principles or whatever that may be while also doing it in a language or an accessible way that they understand. Okay, great. So um, let's, Alexis, I want, why don't you take this next question um, that comes from Ray. Um, I've been thinking about, and this is a great question, of the connection between interpersonal violence and violence against nature. Uh, can you talk about um, how that comes up um, for you? So I'll start with yes. Alexis, and I'm sure others are going to want to comment on this. Yes, I absolutely love this question. And um, one of the like many possibilities to explore in the details of the stories in this anthology is all of the ways that violence manifests itself and how um, it's not separated from um, the way that we treat um, like what many people would frame as our mother, right? Our first mother, the earth. What is our relationship with land? What is our relationship with water? What is our relationship with place? And um, through exploring those relationships, then, then how does that influence um, what becomes possible and what we're willing to tolerate in our relationships with other people that share this planet with us? And so um, I, like we, we I think, um, um, Rufaro and uh, Tanji and Casimir uh, join in. And I, I really do think that Wakanda provides um, uh, a, a lovely tapestry to explore the connections between interpersonal violence and um, violence against the earth. What do y'all think? Um, that was actually addressed in one of the the stories in the anthology. Um, it's Ham Ham Home uh, Junction Road. I will Hum look up home, the exact. Right away on Junction Road. Thank you. I'm home, Thank you. Hideaway um, on Junction Road. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, Kasumia. Um it, In in the editing process, we actually were in an ongoing conversation with the author um, around um, the gendering or not of of um, the earth, um, and also taking into account that many many indigenous peoples all over the world hold the earth as mother and as sacred. And so um, definitely please do check out um, um, Hum Home Hideaway on Junction Road. And, and I think that, um, you know, any, any kind of violence that's visited on a human being um, would essentially tie back to violence on on the natural world. But yeah, that's a great question and I'm glad that we have an offering in the anthology um, that you can refer to. Great. Thank you. Um, we have another question, actually the related questions that um, came, one said was talking about, uh, Jonathan said, I use these types of examples in my young men's engagement work and then Benjamin asked, a maleness is so, cent um, is so centered um, to violence, conquest, and destruction. This plays a significant role in sexual violence and domestic violence as well as the comic book, video game, and other um, nerd end of culture. Where do, where do we start in building a healthy masculinity? Tanji, why don't you start with this? Yeah, I thank you, Benjamin, for bringing that up um, because you're right. Uh, there are those uh, toxic masculine roots that are, are there. And I say, like, it's okay. Of course, we should address it, but we should also um, 
kind of pivot ourselves to identity affirmation and giving folks the space to define themselves. Um, because sometimes people don't look at things like uh, violence as being destructive all the time. Um, there are some spaces where people view it as, like, or men can view it as something that they're health and proud of, even if they don't use it against other people. Um, especially, I'm sorry, especially when they use it against other people. So I think, uh, again, flipping it from just calling out that behavior to giving people the opportunity and space to define themselves, define themselves for themselves and to be able to address those characteristics and traits, but also um, talk about who they are as a whole and not just as masculine in the traditional sense, and that's it. Anyone else want to talk about um about this question about building healthy, um, and in some ways to me reimagining gender is indeed exactly that question and that we don't have to be caught in the binary but we want to be able to reimagine our gender. Um, any other thoughts? Um, I can uh, offer something. Um, so. I think that as we have these conversations, um, it's important um, to ensure that they're intergenerational conversations. Um, you know, I can speak from my fam my own family's context, um, where a cousin um, was undocumented and unable to work, and it was building all kinds of frustration for him, and in how he was relating to his um, to his wife. Um, including um, uh, physical um, physical violence. Um, and you know when that information got back to my father, um, he had a conversation with with this cousin of mine and really in, in my culture, he is my brother, he's not my cousin. And you know the, the first thing my father went to was where within our family line had my cousin ever seen that happen? And then having a conversation about what it is to to shift, be able to shift um, in what's expected um, of him as a man, as the man of the house, in quotation marks, what it is to shift with um, the reality of changes in the world, and also the reality that he had a supportive um, spouse and who was being in partnership with him versus um, uh, belittling or or um, treating him as less than because of his his status and so anyway all of that to say um, as we move to address some of these issues intergenerational conversations are important because there is so much we can learn from that those who have gone before us granted they might be perpetrators of violence sometimes and but um, it's important to ensure that conversations are not just moving within a, a peer group. Thank you much. We are getting to our final minutes, but I want to get to a few more questions that we have. I'm going to, um, the question that Kelsey talked about, uh, within the context of sexual violence prevention in higher education settings, how do you envision art um, in prevention? And so, um, I'm going to go to you. How, what do you think, to start with, what do you think about the role of art in higher ed, looking at uh, university and college settings? I believe that's a great opportunity for collaboration with other departments. Uh, I know not just in academic settings, but it, it, everywhere in any kind of organization, it's easy to get siloed and feel like this is my work, but it's totally separate from other people's work. So I think um, if you already have an art department within your university, uh, there's a time that's a, a time to use what you do in prevention to collaborate with them um, and to see how uh, they view things like gender-based violence. Um, and you can offer them insight, but they could also offer you insight on ways to incorporate artwork into the work that you're already doing. Well, thank you much. Um, we're getting to our final few minutes, and so I think the next um, question, and I, people are, keep on coming in, so this is really great. Um, 
I'd love to just, um, you know, come to you, Casimira and Alexis, about there was a question about how to get some ongoing support because there's these ongoing questions about how to use this and what Resonance Network and Wakanda Dream Lab can do to help support um, this in an ongoing way. Um, yes, and so thank you for that question. Um, uh, so this collaboration is in the process of developing a discussion guide that will shortly be out. And so people who are participating in this call will be sure um, to make sure that you know about the publication guide when it is, um, the discussion guide when it is available. And then specifically to the question around um, uh, technical assistance and support in crafting these conversations. While the guide will have ideas about how that happens, um, I think as a network, our frame on technical assistance comes, is like rooted and grounded in um, like an assumption of peerness. Like we're peers in this and we are all learning together. And so Monty or anyone else who is wanting to, um, to, 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 to learn and to explore with, um, with bringing practice of future storytelling into the places that you work or into the communities that you're imagining and building with, um, the, 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 the network is a network of, uh, at this point, almost 800 people, who, and many of whom are interested in organizing and um, um, like clustering and being in conversation around these things. And so um, like just lifting up that question, we invite everyone, uh, you'll, we'll get in a few minutes just ways to connect with the network. Uh, we invite you to, um, to, to sign up for our list, to be in conversation with us, and uh, uh, we will you know, be opening up spaces, uh, self-organizing spaces, uh, helping to support you as you're having your own spaces uh, to think about what this looks like and, uh, uh, and, and to share back. And as people are doing that, as people are discussing uh, the contents of this anthology, as people are, um, uh, you know, leaping out there and trying to do their own future storytelling, we also want to hear that. We want to hear your stories. If there's an opportunity, if, if people are like, well, shoot, I want to take a stab at some of these. Oh, that was real violent language. Um, I want to uh, try out some of these prompts. And, uh, um, you know, I want to write something. I want to contribute it, contribute it somewhere, and I want to put it out there. Um, let's crowdsource that. Like, let's be, let's be building a, a, a bigger tapestry of, about what is possible and exploring some of these questions that sometimes we can end up getting into in debate about. Um, and, and, you know, here's another opportunity and another invitation to, to engage these questions uh, in a different way. Well, great. Well, thank you, Alexis, and thank you all. Um, I do want to encourage everyone to download your copy today. Um, we put it in the, um, we'll put it again um, in the um, chat and be able to do that. I want to encourage all of you to be able to check in with future Prevent Connect web conferences and other pieces, but most importantly, we want you to be able to connect with Resonance Network and keep this discussion going. This is one of our um, we will be doing more web conferences together with Resonance Network, and I want to really thank all of our speakers um, today. I want to thank you, Rafaro. Thank you, Tanji. Thank you, Casimira. Thank you, Alexis. And most of all, I want to thank everyone in the audience for really sharing and being part of this process of being able to get together. Um, Alexis and Casimira, I'm going to give you a chance to give the last word. Um, so feel free to connect with us. Um, we are on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Um, our, we have an amazing uh, comms team that is um, really helping us push content on Instagram. So you'll see um, the, like the link in bio for the, um, the anthology, and also um, we'll be posting updates on all those platforms about like the discussion guide and other things that um, we'll be up to. And definitely feel free to connect with us through that as well. Um, and our email is info at resonance-network.org. Um, thank you, everybody. And thanks, everyone, for joining us for today's Resonance Network for VentConnect web conference. And um, thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing you in our next um, opportunity. So this concludes today's um, web conference.